Welcome to another episode of Gov2TV. I'm your host, Walter Schwabe. Today we've got an absolutely terrific show, as we always do. I'm sure if you tune in regularly, I, I hope you think the same thing. Today we're going to be joined by a couple of uh, open government colleagues from uh, down south of the border. Uh, today, John Walton, the CIO for the City of San Francisco, uh, is on the show today and joined by his colleague Jay Nath, who's the Director of Innovation with the Department of Technology for the City of San Francisco. Uh, John, Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, let, you know, uh, let's talk a little bit about, let's give a little bit of foundation here in terms of uh, the City of San Francisco and the things that you guys are doing. That's what I'd like today's show to be about, uh, highlighting some of the things that you're doing in your city uh, to make you more open, transparent, collaborative, all of those good things. Let's start a little bit about uh, talking about Open 311. Now, last year, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you guys opened up uh, Open 311, um, Open 311 APIs. And so the, the, the whole project there uh, was, uh, I think, the, the first of its kind across the nation with respect to uh, the 311 side of things. John, can you expand a little bit on the project and uh, how it got started and then maybe progress today to where we are today and how it's going? Sure. I, you know, I'll say a few things about it. I'd like, you know, obviously Jay was the leader on it and really did the, the heavy lifting on the project. I mean, I, I'm privileged. I've only been the CIO here now for about six months, following in you know, the footsteps of Chris Vian, who I really think is a thought leader and a visionary in this area, who worked closely with Jay on the Open 311 project. You know, for me, uh, what Open 311 is about is utilizing the technologies available today and, and breaking down the barriers between traditional government systems and creating avenues by which citizens, companies, other governments can easily create applications that interface with their 311 systems and, and not rely on the traditional uh, perhaps you know hiring a systems integrator to come in and create a custom web page but empowering people to have access to that data to functionality that in a traditional model would have taken a long time to to create would have taken a lot of taxpayer dollars i think what chris and jay were able to achieve was by creating uh, really a community of people that came together and uh, developed this a way where people can easily develop applications now and have read-write access to our to our government databases um, around 311 data. And, and where I see it going in the future is kind of continuing that journey. I, when I talk with other cities, you know, Chicago and Seattle and L.A. and other cities around the world, the, the idea around Open 311, I think, is uh, an organic idea that can grow over time. To me... Again, it's about empowering people to have direct access to data to create their own custom applications or, or, or meet their own needs in a sense. And all, all governments that I can see, we all understand we have the same challenges uh, in front of us to create avenues for access to our data, for people to interact with them, not just have the traditional read access, but analysis of the data and read write access. And I think by working together on projects like 311, internally with the private sector with other governments we can really start to grow that rapidly and then break down some of those silos well john thank you for mentioning chris veen and uh, and certainly uh, jay's contribution to the project and it's great to have jay on the show today to to speak to that um you know and and, and chris in, in light of chris veen uh you know that's where uh, chris moore the cio from the city of edmonton actually uh, was able to contact uh, Chris Veen, and the two of them were able to collaborate a little bit. And I remember the announcement uh, being made about this project and the fact that uh, we found out uh, through the YouTube video of the announcement that the City of Edmonton logo was actually represented as some of the organizations uh, participating in the project, and we found that really interesting and very cool. And I know that that was sort of my first, my first introduction to this particular project. Jay... I know that uh, on the pre-show here, you had mentioned that uh, you had met uh, Chris Moore uh, in the past when, when Chris was down there. Can you give us, just uh, just to accentuate a little bit more on what John was talking about, 
What did you see uh, in terms of your personal thoughts on the project and, and how it came together? Sure. I, I think from a kind of a genesis standpoint, uh, the idea of interoperability standards has been out there. If you look at um, the Internet itself, it's based on open standards. And um, clearly there's been a lot of innovation and creativity on top of those types of standards. And um, our, our kind of trajectory on in this project came about in 2009. We launched with Twitter. We were one of the first cities to launch with Twitter and 311 so that our residents could tweet in uh, requests or ask questions via Twitter. And we recognized that was a great step forward, another, another channel for our community to use. But from an efficiency and you know, uh, perspective, it wasn't ideal. Uh, the information had to be re-entered by our staff into the, the technology platform that, that's used to manage through in one. And so the idea came about really from the community. I, I wouldn't say that San Francisco or any one person came up with the idea. Um, we definitely played a re leadership role in working with the community. Open Plans had a very uh, strong role. They're a nonprofit from New York City. And we worked with several cities on making this effort happen, Edmonton being one of them, Washington, D.C., another, <clears throat> and actually uh, a lot of citizens, too, people in the community who were interested in, in this area. We worked together to put this, this specification together. And we recognized that this is just a starting point. Uh, creating interoperability and standards is, is the easy part. It's really exciting to the community of developers and, and artists and journalists to actually use that information um, to create new services. That, that's the harder part. And I think we're making a lot of good success in that area. We're starting to see vendors, uh, large companies like Lagan, who is one of the primary CRM players in, in this space, actually adopting, formally adopting open 3 and one into their product set, um, providing that to their customer base um, we're seeing it in small companies. We're seeing it in um, individual developers. So it's really, I think, just a, a beginning of a, a larger community that's evolving and growing. And it really has taken a, a life of its own. San Francisco is still very much part of it, but um, our role is is one of, of many. Okay. Well, let me, let me pick up a little bit on that, Jay. Thank you for that. Uh, John, uh, talking about um, the, the sustainability of this, one of the things about contests, for example, app contests, is the, the, the turnover, the evolution, the sustainability. The market chooses which apps will survive coming out of a contest. You know, some are, some are great for a moment and some last, uh, you know, uh, indefinitely going forward, let's say. Um, are you seeing the same kind of thing as this evolution happens with Open 311 where you've maybe had some apps developed or things and solutions uh, uh, proposed, uh, but they've been quickly, you know, sort of cast aside because they maybe just missed the mark a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You're right. And it's, it's definitely an evolving model. And, and Jay and I have talked about this a lot. The great thing about open data, things like um, allowing your data to be accessible, uh, seeing the contests, which generate great response. You have the community come in and develop all these applications is, as you pointed out, that initial surge of development, of innovation. And I think we saw maybe uh, upwards of 60 applications developed when we first launched the uh, SF Open Data initiative. What I see now, uh, one of the roles of government as you pointed out, is really starting to watch kind of that self-selection process, that sort of natural uh, evolution of 60 apps are developed, um, how many of those are going to be adopted and embraced by the users. You know, a lot of times uh, it's like art, it's like science, there, there is that self-selection process that happens. And I think one of the roles of government is to not control necessarily the applications that are developed, but really understand which ones are being adopted by their users, being embraced, becoming integral um, parts of the community, and then being supportive of those so that they don't fail. So you do have a long-term plan. I mean, one of the you know you asked me you know in the old days what kept a CIO awake? What kept me awake in the old days was uh, would I get the money for my project? Would I be able to deliver my project on time? Would I be able to 
have the maintenance dollars. Uh, what I think about now is if that application is wildly adopted, though I didn't develop, um, but is developed using my uh, data, and the community becomes reliant upon it, how can I ensure the longevity of it, the success of it? Because what I don't want to have happen is have a, a you know fantastically uh, successful application that suddenly one day uh, stops working, and I start getting you know outraged phone calls from the public, uh, demanding that a uh, mom maps <laughs> right, is right. brought back online. I, I need to ensure as a CIO and as a a leader in the city that we're working with the community to foster the continued success out of the applications that people are enthusiastically embracing. What are you finding in terms of the, the, this whole initiative with, uh, with Open 311? How has it affected uh, processes and people in departments behind the scenes? Because, you know, if you get to start to get an influx of uh, certain amounts of data uh, response from that human sensor network out there, you're leveraging an app to give you more information that you had before, how has that affected processes that maybe... I don't know if I want to use the word antiquated, but but they were fine before when you had maybe just nothing more than a phone line, let's say, um, and an email address. And now they're being inundated in other ways. Have you found some growing pains there? I've, you know, the feedback I've gotten from departments, frankly, has been positive. I, I think that the departments that are hosting the data or that we're hosting on their behalf, I think they want that feedback. I, I, I truly believe that... The, the city and the departments in the city, the agencies, are very keenly interested in having good data. Um, and they see the community now as partners in creating good data. But to your point, and perhaps Jay is more personally experienced with this, it, it is interesting um, the expectations of how fast data is going to be improved. Uh, to your point, the traditional means might have been write us a letter if you have a problem with our data, or come talk to us, or uh, call us on the phone and we'll get back to you when we can. I mean, because it's online now, because we're using digital tools uh, like web forms, like tweets, like uh, emails, the expectation is when data problems are identified that they're fixed and that the, the resolution to the problem, I won't say is instantaneous, but is much more rapid than I think the traditional government um, psychology is used to. Right. Yeah, the, the, I mean, certainly the probably the unreasonable expectation is that you you take a, a twit pic of a pothole, you submit that, and before the the picture gets seen, uh, there's a road crew there filling it up and and having it all roll, you know, uh, paved over. Uh, but certainly, have you seen and witnessed um, Jay with respect to this project in particular that either citizens' expectations have have evolved and changed, or have they been amplified in any way? Have you seen evidence of that? I think so. I think that from a consumer standpoint, um, they have much more access to technology, and they have certain expectations when, when they deal with private corporations. And you see that same sort of expectations with government. And so the ability to use their handheld phones and other channels to, to request services to get information is, is something that more and more people are expecting. And I think Open Three and One delivers on that promise. I think what it does do, to your point, is that it it does highlight some of our our legacy systems that may not be capable of either managing the capacity or some of the information. And just as an example, uh, when people are taking pictures with their mobile phones, we send that information to our agencies, but they may not be able to actually get access to that picture, have it print out in a work order and actually utilize that information properly. And, um, you know, I think it's it's part of an evolution. Uh, from a technology standpoint, I think those are all solvable problems. I think the bigger challenge is getting, um, you know, the service workers accustomed to the fact that people are using different channels and protocols, and many of those channels aren't being uh, kind of triaged by humans. And right. so there's a, there's a concern on their side that the quality isn't there. But I think if you have good design uh, with, with the mobile applications or web apps, that you can avoid some of those issues. Fair um, enough. And I also think that we took you know, some, some baby steps to get there. You know, with our work with Twitter, uh, allowing our community to use that, that was a very good first step in kind of a, a new channel and getting our, our city staff more accustomed to, to these emerging channels. 
And so the, the arguments for Open 3-in-1 were, were much easier to, to respond to. So it was more of a, it, it seems like there was a, certainly some level of uh, a larger sort of uh, process training and uh, uh, shifting in thinking. Uh, what I'm hearing from both you and John is that there, there were some of those elements, uh, undertones to this. I mean, it wasn't just simply about lines of code and technology and applications. It was also about how the people within these various departments uh, do their job maybe a little bit differently, maybe better, maybe more efficiently. Uh, in some way, shape, or form, uh, you know, and so it's getting those people to that place where they were uh, ready, willing, maybe able, or they were already that, but but giving them the proper tools. Would you say is that a fair assessment? I, I think that's a fair assessment. I, I part of it's the psychology of a new initiative, right? And um, your example about how does it change um, the culture of a government? I think. I'll, I'll use an example I used with our service desks in the past is in the past, um, often performance was measured um, in how many calls we received, how many, you know, wait time on hold and things like that. I, I'm a strong believer in customer satisfaction is strongly linked to the conversation. So uh, my experience with service desks with customer type interfaces is um, if a customer places a call and doesn't get an answer, they're frustrated. Equally, if a customer logs an issue problem or a complaint and they feel like there is no feedback mechanism, there is no conversation occurring, it's, it's launched into some mysterious phone call, I left a message or I sent an email I never heard back. I, I think the beauty of Open 311 and where we're going with these systems is, is it establishes a conversation between the city workers and the people who have concerns about the service or the problem. And so... What I see, actually, when I talk to the public is it's not so much their concern, perhaps, that the problems resolve more quickly, but at least they understand that they have a connection with a person where they're having a conversation about the problem after it's logged, and they understand where it is in the process. If there is a delay in resolving the problem, that they're in that conversational loop and they can see and talk to each other about this is a real big problem. Can you please also you know, chime in on what we can do to resolve this problem? And so. I think just creating the dialogue to some extent improves the level of customer satisfaction and, and the, the benefit the public sees from it rather than, again, the, the older systems where you, you'd enter in a form on a web page, it would go somewhere, and then someday you'd hope to hear back, or maybe you would never hear back. Right. It's narrowing the gap between citizen and government. And, and again, I think it, you're right. There is a, a change in how city workers or government workers become involved in that dialogue. Um, they're sort of traditional <laughs> uh, ways the government has dealt with those in the past. But I, again, I think it's a it's bridging the gap between how we in our personal lives interact with each other and translating that into how we provide uh, government services. So, so let me let me uh, let me ask you then. You know, there there are definitely just like sort of all markets, I suppose. There are the early adopters and they're the, they're, they're laggards. Okay. Uh, it, it, part of the the uh, the marketing curve, bell curve, if you will, and you know, crossing Jeffrey Moore's book about crossing the chasm in software development, I think applies here in some respects. Think about the the communities out there, regardless of size, whether they're small, medium, or large, and but but imagine that they they have probably the most um, conservative, uh, you know, risk adverse administration whether it be, uh, you know, again, at any size, what are some of the, what would say, what would be the number one piece of advice that you'd offer to them to help them down this road to, to you know, sort of remove the, some level of fear and that it's not as scary as maybe some people think? Um, I'll give you my perhaps too high level <laughs> answer to that and let Jay chime in on uh, for more personal experiences. I, my advice to, to organizations like that is to um, encourage them to go, become more comfortable with a collaborative process that has much shorter cycles and is much more iterative and involves more people. The, the traditional models I've seen in government where you take a year to get the money, a year to issue an RFP, a year to collect the requirements, you launch four years later, You've already missed that window of opportunity to solve the problem. The frustration has grown to such a level that 
anything you were trying to do to solve the problem is buried beneath the weight of people's frustration with the delay. And in, even though in a risk adverse organization, that's the traditional way to do it because you're ensuring a very methodical process, I strongly believe that the best way to resolve these problems and to make progress is to involve the community, to create a very open, dynamic, dialogue-driven process. And I, again, I think people, once they get engaged in the process, even if the progress is incremental and perhaps flawed along certain steps of the way, um, I think the end result is much better. And I think if governments can get comfortable with that iterative process that has dead ends sometimes and, and missteps sometimes, that they'll reach a better uh, uh, position in the end. Don't be afraid to sort of reach out and get creative and take a, take a bit of a risk. Jay, how about yourself? What do you think? I, you know, I, I tend to agree with John that we do have this kind of waterfall approach that uh, we try to reach for perfection um, in our design and, and try to implement to that point. And I think that's a noble goal, but there's just, there's different ways to get there. And I think an iterative agile approach is, is definitely a good one to adopt. It's worked very well here in San Francisco. I would say around Open 3 and one I know that for a lot of people, it's a, it's a huge paradigm shift in the way of thinking and, and, and not maybe relying upon a single vendor. It's more of a community effort. I would encourage them to look at the value proposition around Open 3 and one and take a, take a hard look at the risks. And I think if you do that math, you'll see that the value is much greater than the risks involved. And with the, the deepening of the ecosystem, we now have vendors. So if you're uncomfortable with, you know, kind of writing your own code or um, not having that single throat to choke, you do have that in with new vendors that are out there in the market. There is actually three or four of them out there that are supporting Open 3 and one API. And I think that's a great hallmark of this space becoming a real marketplace for, for cities to, to use. And um, it also empowers them to grow and be more flexible in the future as Open 3 and one grows they can grow with it and, and gain the benefits. So that would be my word to those communities that are a little bit more cautious in terms of risk. Great. Let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit here. Let's uh, going away from Open Three One One now. Let's. Uh, I want to talk about a, a, an application, and then I want to ask you guys about cloud computing here in just a minute. In our last uh, few minutes here on the show, uh, tell us uh, quickly how has uh, sfpark.org been received? Uh, what are your thoughts on it and How's it going along, this little application about parking in San Francisco? I can give you my perspective on it, and John can maybe give a, a higher-level picture. So I've been working with their, their project director for a little bit of time. His name is Jay Primus. And my, my words of wisdom, or just my two cents maybe, was to open up the data from the beginning, uh, to share the information that they have, and to let the community develop applications on top of it. I think they've done a great job in doing that, both from a technical standpoint and also from an awareness standpoint. They've done, uh, they've highlighted the fact that this is very developer friendly. This project. Um, what was interesting is that they actually developed an iPhone application when they launched SF Park formally. Um, that didn't prevent uh, access or or uh, prevent developers from creating their own solutions. So they wanted to have something out there that they could brand that they could say, this is a city's offering, but they also let the marketplace in. So if somebody creates a better application, um, our citizens could use that application as well. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a project that's huge in scope and the open data piece of it and the mobile application piece of it is a small sliver. I think there was some criticism about using a mobile application while you're driving. I mean, that does seem to be um, something that uh, is hard to address. Uh, how do you get information to people who are driving? But I think those are solvable problems, and I think if we've got some creative minds, we can help uh, resolve that issue. Yeah, I, I, I do think, I, whether you're a fan of it or not a fan of it, I mean, I think the important thing, again, is um, the data. To me, it's about the data. And I think the applications are valuable, but only as valuable as the data that you have that you're building the applications on. And I. I'm a big fan of let the market, let the public develop the applications they feel is important based on the data. On the other hand, I, I'm not opposed um, if 
government has a role if the if it doesn't if it isn't self created if the community doesn't generate the application then I do think government has an opportunity to perhaps develop its own application that it sees a need for from the public. Right. Uh, I, I think you can do both. I don't think it has to be an either or statement. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned distracted driving because here in Alberta, we've got uh, distracted driving legislation being laid out by the provincial government. And in fact, where I live and where our studios here are at Fuse Logic TV, we're in a, a place called Sherwood Park, which is part of Strathcona County nestled right beside the city of Edmonton. So we're just on the east of the city of Edmonton. And we have uh, been, it, it's, uh, we have a law here, a bylaw about distracted driving. It's not allowed, you're not allowed to use your cell phone or, or mobile device without uh, hands-free. And so it's interesting because, uh, you know, bringing that up, Jay, it, uh, it, it shines a different light on this particular application just because we can leverage the open data just because we can, you know, and ha- allow others to do the same thing and build interesting apps on it. In this particular case, pretty soon, this wouldn't be something that would actually be legal in this province uh, in any city or town. So it, it's kind of, uh, it's interesting how, you know, laws and bylaws and, and things that citizens are asking for impact the way maybe certain applications either do get built, get used, or, or survive. Moving on now to cloud computing. It was just earlier this year that uh, that you guys made an announcement related to email, cloud computing, and Microsoft. Quickly tell us a little bit about that, John. Sure. I, I think that's another example, again, where government needs to uh, look to what has been successful, perhaps, in the corporate environment, in the public environment, what the public's embrace. I mean, for years, uh, we in government have tried to run our own email systems as a service. And I and I still think there is a time and a place for that. If you have highly secure, highly sensitive data, that you need to be uh, ensured that is on your premise and things like that. Um, however, I'll, I'll never forget, I was at a, a luncheon quite a few years ago now, I guess, where Scott McNeely from Sun was speaking. And and that was back when Sun was still trying to sell email as, as one of their product offerings. And Scott actually made a point at the thing saying, you know, I think, and that's why I still think he's a visionary, and he said at the time, in five years, there'll only be two or three email providers because email, no one's, no one can make money off of email. It has become a commodity, and it is something that email is a cost to a business to run uh, and an expensive one, and people are going to become consumers of it. And I think you saw Gmail and AOL and Hotmail and Yahoo Mail demonstrate in the public um, sector that everyone would consume email for free or as low a cost as possible to get their own personal accounts. And what we're trying to do in government is see if we can take that model. Certainly, the I would argue that the public consumer grade uh, emails that are out there perhaps aren't ideal for government today. But I think as government can start migrating uh, users into a government type cloud email system, I think there's real benefits to that. I think it improves the experience for our users. I know the users we've rolled uh, the Microsoft hosted email out to uh, love it. You know, they think it's great. They're moving from an old antiquated email system. They're now using something that they use in their homes, you know, the type of quality and grade that they use in their homes. And it demonstrates innovation for them. They see us as, as catching up to the world and technology. For me, it saves money, which is an important thing in any government. If I can save money on technology, then I can spend it on parks. I can spend it on police services. I can spend it on other things. I think government, though, um, as an early adopter, I feel like one of my roles in government is to push the vendors to continue to improve those technologies, to improve those business models to suit the needs of government as as well as fiscally possible. So in addition to saving money, cloud computing is, is uh, and, and it has to be, okay, those in the industry, we, we know that it has to be secure. If it's not secure, it won't be used. But the the message that I heard you say there, there were many, but the thing that you're saying is it's absolutely secure. And uh, and that's one of the, the criticisms of people who don't do a lot of research into cloud computing to really truly understand the levels of security. But uh, you guys are, are completely comfortable with that all the way, yes? Security, you know, and there's other articles about San Francisco and security that I won't get into and we don't have time for. <laughs> Uh, but I, I will say security is important no matter what you do. And whether you're running systems internally, there's security concerns and risks about internal run systems with security. If you move your data and your applications to the cloud, 
there's different risks, but I think the important thing is having a good security review of any internal system or external system, having a plan, having a contract, having a methodology by which you review and ensure that the system is as secure as you can possibly afford. And that's, at the end of the day, none of us can pretend that anything in the cloud is perfectly secure. I would also argue to any government or private corporation, nothing internal is perfectly secure either. So it's where do you want to manage your security and do you have a good security plan for that system? Completely agree with that. Now, just a parting thought, guys, just a little bit of fun. And I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I know that I'm, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be putting you on the spot. But uh, each of you, uh, starting Jay with you, what is your absolute favorite app uh, built for uh, the city of San Francisco? Anything at all? What's your favorite app to use every day? You know, I, I have started using public transportation more, so I would say it's Routesy. It's an application that tells you when the next bus is coming, and um, I think it's it's a reflection of all the interest in that area. There's over a dozen applications around transit because it is really important in people's lives. So that that would be my vote. John, how about you? S similar to Jay, I drive a lot. <laughs> I'm a commuter. So 511.org, um, you know, when I drive home or drive into the city, um, I have multiple routes I can take. I'm all about how can I get there? How can I avoid the wrecks? What's How long is it going to take me to get to the place? And maybe in a future conversation, we can have that conversation about distracted driving and how technology <laughs> can either help or hurt us. I have some, I have some pretty strong opinions about that. So. Well, that, that would be, that sounds like an absolutely fantastic conversation, John. And I would absolutely welcome to welcome you back onto the show in a future date. Uh, Jay, thank you so much, both of you for joining today. Uh, for those of you watching, I was joined today by John Walton, the CIO of the city of San Francisco, Jay Naff. Uh, he's with the department of uh, innovation at, or sorry, pardon me, department of technology, not innovation. Uh, and thank you both to, to spend all this time with, uh, with us today. Uh, for those of you, again, you're watching every Thursday, we like to air at 1.30 Mountain Standard here on FuseLogic TV. For watching this on, uh, show on demand, it will be up shortly on our YouTube channel at FuseLogic TV. Uh, again, once again, thanks for my, uh, uh, my audience members and thanks to the guests today tuning in. Uh, this has been Gov2. Hopefully you've uh, found out uh, something more about what's going on in the open government sector today. Certainly all the great things that are going on down in the city of San Francisco. We only just barely scratched the surface of what's going on down there. Uh, tune in next week. Uh, we're looking to hopefully, hopefully have uh, Chris Moore from the city of uh, Edmonton on. And if we can't get Chris, we'll have another great guest for you. We'll see you next week.